do to look in a physical Bible as we go through the Bible this morning. It is easy to kind of follow along, especially since we're just going through the book of Mark together. Today we'll be in Mark chapter 3 in just a moment, so those are there on the chairs available for you. And I do want to point out once again, I know I say this a lot, but those handouts are really helpful. If you're the type of person that takes notes, that's one thing. But in addition to the notes, there's some announcements on there. There's a worship song suggestion. There's a prayer emphasis. And on the back side of those handouts, there's some um, discussion questions that you can discuss with your spouse or a friend about the lesson today. And... A really, really good and helpful family devotion if you sit down with your family at some time this week to kind of talk about some of the things that we learned. That is all on the back of those sheets. So I highly encourage you to um, use those things. Now, as we begin today, I want to share with you a little bit about a funny little phenomenon that occurs in my house that has become a little bit of a running joke. Um, and that is because my wife, during the week, goes to bed earlier than I do because she has to wake up earlier for work. Many nights, I come into the room as quietly as possible, like church mouse quiet, barely opening the door. But she is so alert, even in her sleep, that just about no matter what, most of the time, she sometimes even sits up and says, who's there? What's going on? Like she has to know in her moment of confusion as she comes out of this sleepy fog, she has to know right away if someone is there to murder her or not. And it's always just me, but she is deeply afraid of this. And here's the thing. Um, I don't know what happened to my wife in her life that made her as a Navy SEAL to sleep with one eye open to defend her family. But I do sleep better as a result because I know that if anybody's going to try to come after me, they got to get past her first. And she is the most sensitive alarm on the planet. Now, all that is to say, when there is a state of confusion, like my wife feels when she's woken up in the middle of the night, for whatever reason... What we need to know are the basics. We need to know who's there, what are they doing, and what is going on. And what we have seen as we've begun studying the book of Mark, like we've talked about throughout this as the first couple of chapters, is this growing level of confusion. Remember, Mark is telling us the story of Jesus. And while Mark, with the power of hindsight is able to accurately identify and describe for us who Jesus is and what he's doing, the people that are um, experiencing the events that Mark is talking about, they didn't have that. They didn't know these things, right? So oftentimes, even though we're able to see this clear picture of who Jesus is, this is who he is, this is what he's doing, many of the people that Mark is describing don't really know that. And that causes a wide variety of responses from these people. So Mark is showing this understandable level of confusion among the people as Jesus, the Son of God, was walking the earth, which is a confusing thing. How could God be a man? What is he here to do? What is the appropriate response? That's what we've seen kind of cropping up as we've studied the book of Mark together. And as my friend Robbie discussed last week with the beginning of Mark chapter 3, this tension, this confusion was building, and it was beginning to reach the point in which there were some people who, in their confusion, were seeking to destroy Jesus. Like my wife on guard duty at night, these confused individuals were ready to resort to violence because of their confusion. And that's understandable, but we want to be careful as we read and study the Bible to understand who is Jesus and what's going on? What is he here to do? Now, we've got a lot of scripture to get through today, so I do encourage you to look with me at Mark chapter 3. We're going to pick up right where we left off last week at verse 7. It says this, Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the sea, and a great crowd followed from Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem and Idumea and from beyond the Jordan and from around Tyre and Sidon. When the great crowd heard all that he was doing, they came to him. And he told his disciples to have a boat ready for him because of the crowd, lest they crush him. For he had healed many, so that all who had diseases pressed around him to touch him. And whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God. And he strictly ordered them not to make him known. Now, as we've discussed, the healing ministry of Jesus garnered a great deal of attention. Everyone wanted to see, like we talked about a couple weeks ago, the miracle man. And here we see some of the ramifications of the people's excitement, but also of their confusion. 
Jesus is literally trying to get away. The crowds are becoming too much. But the crowds track him down and follow him even as he tries to escape. And from the locations that are described in this verse, what it's showing us is this. Some people traveled upwards of 100 miles or more from their homes to follow this miraculous Jesus. And the passage makes it clear that the people came because they had heard and seen what Jesus could do. And as we see over and over, this popularity often had less to do with who he was and what he taught and a lot more to do with what he could do for people. Now, they're so eager to see and experience this healing power of Jesus that they're crowding around him so tightly that he was at risk of being crushed and needed an escape boat to get away from his rabid fans. And it almost seems in this passage that Mark is highlighting the level of confusion and misunderstanding of the people by adding in verse 11 that the evil spirits that Jesus was casting out seem to have a better grasp on who this Jesus was than even the people did. The demons exclaimed rightly that Jesus is the Son of God. The people only wanted to see what Jesus could do, but the demons and evil spirits actually saw who he was. And again, Mark is continually reminding us of what he has laid out in the first verse of his gospel, that Jesus is the Son of God. And furthermore, like we discussed a couple of weeks ago, we should understand as we read these things, as we read these accounts of the miracles, on this side of the story, we see that Jesus' miracles served to validate his message. It wasn't just healing for the sake of healing. It was healing for the sake of delivering the good news of what he would provide, which was better than immediate physical healing. He was going to provide something more. So to kind of give us an overarching idea, based on what we've read before and as we approach the text today, we should understand this. The first blank on your sheet is that Jesus is the presence and the purpose of God. Mark has made this abundantly clear that Jesus is the Son of God, and then here is what he is doing. Mark's book is based highly on Jesus' actions. What did he do? He has a purpose. He is trying to achieve something. Jesus is the culmination of the plan of God all coming together. Now, the people, in most cases, didn't really get it. They didn't understand it. The demons and evil spirits seemed to understand it even more than the people. Jesus came as the Son of God, God's very presence among us, and he came for the purpose of restoring and forgiving and to preach the message that we have mentioned many times that Jesus said himself in chapter 1, that his message was this, repent and believe the good news. Jesus is the presence of God himself. He's the culmination of God's purposes and plans, and as Christians, we hold this as the highest truth. Now, with this kind of tension and misunderstanding properly built up, Mark is going to take a little bit of a side trail. He's going, to, he's going to take a turn and explain something different that seems a little bit unrelated. But what I want you to begin to see is that Mark is drawing a distinction here between those who are called, those who know, those who recognize who this Jesus is, what his presence is, what his purpose is, and those who are confused, those who don't understand. So let's continue on in verses 13 to 19. It says this. And he went up on the mountain and called to him those whom he desired, and they came to him. And he appointed twelve whom he also named apostles, so that they might be with him, and he might send them out to preach and have authority to cast out demons. He appointed the twelve, Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, to whom he gave, gave the name Boanerges, with that is, sons of thunder. Andrew and Philip and Bartholomew and Matthew and Thomas and James the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus and Simon the Zealot and Judas Iscariot who betrayed him. Now hopefully you'll recall we've already seen the calling of some of these people before. We saw the calling of Simon and Andrew, right? We saw them getting called specifically by Jesus. And then James and John got called by Jesus. And then a couple of weeks ago, we talked about the calling of Levi, who here is called Matthew, right? We saw Jesus calling these men. And as you read this list, you may think to yourself a couple of things. That's not who I thought the disciples were. Are there any names that stood out to you on the list? Does anybody remember the great works of Bartholomew or Thaddeus? 
Did all of you realize that there were two disciples named James? Like, these are kind of forgettable things, and that's a little bit of an odd thing when, it, when we come to our Christian perspective. Because the truth is this. The Bible doesn't give us a very detailed story of every single one of these 12 men. In fact, some of these men that Mark lists here are not even mentioned again throughout the rest of the, the Gospel of Mark. Church history does, however, teach us a good deal about most of these people and kind of what they stood for and what they did afterwards and kind of where they did ministry as they were sent out as apostles. And if, like, let me point out the handouts again. On the back of that handout, there's a QR code that you can scan with your phones for your family devotion, which will lead you to a website that gives you great detail about all 12 of these disciples for your kids to begin to learn who some of these men were. But regardless, this is what we see. Jesus appoints his followers. He calls them. They don't apply, and they don't offer their skills and knowledge. Jesus wasn't out picking the best or most qualified men for the job. No, these were just regular guys, except for the fact that Jesus called them. So the next blank on your sheet, what I think we need to understand as we go through Mark chapter 3 today is this, that Jesus calls his followers into his presence and his purpose. In a very real sense, what we see here is Jesus pulling some people out of confusion and into the light of his reality. He's opening their hearts and minds. He's showing them who he is and what he has come to do. It says so very clearly right there in the verse. In verse 14, it says he called them so that they might be with him, his presence, and he might send them out to preach his purpose. They are called into his presence and for his purpose. What we ought to understand is this. And we'll talk about this more as we go on a little bit later today. But this is true for us as well. If you are a person who has come to faith in Jesus Christ, who has repented of your sins to follow Jesus, then you have the Holy Spirit, God's presence, living in you, constantly present with you. This is the new development of the new covenant, is that the Holy Spirit lives in the hearts of of believers, it is part of who we are. We are in the presence of God because God has inhabited us. And even more than that, it's not just that he's there for no reason. No, he has called us to his purposes. We live according to what he has called us to do. <clears throat> but back to the passage here, even with the calling and the organization of the 12 who were meant to know and understand things best, the situation surrounding Jesus, again, Mark is drawing for us this distinction that these are, the, these are the 12 who would understand the presence and purpose of Jesus, but that wasn't easily understood by all people. And we see that highlighted in verses 20 to 21. It says this. It says, then he went home and the crowd gathered again so that they could not even eat. And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him for they were saying he's out of his mind. Even Jesus' own family here doesn't seem to fully understand his purposes and plans. Jesus is out doing what he came to do. He is fulfilling his purpose. He is healing people and preaching to them and teaching them. And it's gone on for so long and the crowd is so enthusiastic about it that they're not even letting Jesus get away to eat. And like a really loving grandma, which I hope you have had in your life, that is really concerned about whether or not you've had enough to eat today, Jesus' family comes to him and they're like, has he eaten today? Let's get that boy fed. Has he lost his mind? It's past lunchtime. And I really appreciate that kind of love and care from people. In fact, my wife does this for me when we're doing church events. When I'm really, really busy, like trying to work everything, make everything work, she comes to me and says, look, honey, you haven't eaten. It is time for you to get some food. And I really appreciate that kind of love and care, right? It's really nice. I hope that you have a person in your life that says, have you lost your mind? It is time for a meal. Y'all don't let me miss a meal. Now, the general idea that we see building here, this is the lighter side of it. We're about to see the darker side of it. But the light side of it is this, that many people are confused, and as we'll see in a second, are even an antagonistic towards the work of God through Christ. That's the next blank on your sheet, that many people are confused and even antagonistic towards the work of God through Christ. There is confusion. They do not understand. Their minds are not open to the truth. Now, like I said, we'll see this confusion turn to indignation and antagonism as Mark continues in verses 22 to 27. It says this. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, he is possessed by Beelzebul, and by the prince of demons he casts out the demons. And he called them to him and said to them in parables, 
How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but is coming to an end. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man. Then indeed he may plunder his house. Let's take a moment to think about what's happening here. What we see here is what was confusion for some has turned into flat-out malice for others. The excited crowds that nearly crushed Jesus because of their excitement to be near him, the crowds that came and prevented him from even having a meal, they may not have fully understood what he was there for. They may not have really fully grasped what this meant for them. But what we see here with these men is different. This is much more dark. These Jewish religious leaders and authorities have heard Jesus teach. They have seen him perform miracles. They have seen this Jesus do incredible things. They have even heard him teach, as we talked about two weeks ago, about the forgiveness of sins. And yet, they have chosen to willfully and intentionally mischaracterize what Jesus has made clear. We should understand this. These people are not just in a place of disbelief. No, they are committing what amounts to spiritual slander. In their hardness of hearts, they see the work of God and call it the opposite of what it is. Now, Mark has been careful to establish for us, as we've said many times, that Jesus is the Son of God. But these men choose to declare that Jesus is himself Possessed by, it says, Beelzebul. Now, that, that's a weird kind of specific reference in the New Testament. That word doesn't come up a lot in the Bible, but maybe you've heard it in comedies and things like that before. Sometimes it's Beelzebub. They, they kind of mean similar things. What it really translates to at the time was the prince or lord of evil spirits. Sometimes it's even translated as lord of the flies. It's an evil person from the evil one, which means that they understand that they are calling Jesus the son of Satan. They're claiming here that the demons answer to his authority because he is the master of demons. Now, that's a big deal. And Jesus' answer comes to them very strongly and very simply. Jesus says, how can Satan cast out Satan? Jesus' work in healing the sick and casting out demons and forgiving sins is so clearly and obviously counter to the purposes of Satan. If Jesus works for Satan, then he is quite possibly the worst lord of demons that ever has been, right? And then you see that quote from Jesus that was made famous by Abraham Lincoln on the eve of the Civil War, where he says that a house divided against itself cannot stand. We know that to be true. But Jesus' point here is more than just a simple statement about the importance and necessity of unity. Jesus goes on to explain, somewhat metaphorically, that sin and Satan will lose. See, understand this. Based on what Jesus said, Satan's house and purposes cannot and will not stand if Jesus was with him because his house would be divided and a house divided against itself cannot stand. But even further than that, Jesus says this, no one can enter a strong man's house and steal his stuff without first defeating the strong man. And for us as believers who understand the rest of the story of Jesus, we know this, on this side of the cross, we understand this short parable most clearly. Satan is the strong man. This world is his house. It's a world dominated by sin. And Satan, in some ways in the Bible, is described as kind of the, the ruler over this temporary kingdom. But Jesus will indeed defeat him. He will bind the strong man, and Jesus will plunder his house. It will not be because of internal division that Satan is defeated. It is because Jesus will defeat the strong man. The strong man will be bound by a stronger one. Do you see this? And then what Jesus says next to these religious leaders who have now slandered his name is one of the more challenging portions of the gospel. 
it reveals a difficult truth about the misconceptions and the confusion of some people. And we should be careful to consider this couple of verses really carefully. Look at Mark chapter 3, verses 28 to 29. Jesus says this. <clears throat> Truly I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the Son of Man in whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they were saying he has an unclean spirit. I don't know if any of you remember this, but there was a trend on the internet back in about 2006, 2007, uh, going around called the Blasphemy Challenge, which seemed like it should be something that pastors like me should be really upset about. I wasn't super bothered by it. It really just saddened me. But the way the trend went was this, that there were lots of young people particularly that because of their disillusionment, because they wanted to be edgy and cool, because they wanted to say that they have no need for religion, no need for God, they would go on their YouTube channels and post a video taking the blasphemy challenge. Because this verse says that blasphemy will not be forgiven, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, they would intentionally look into their cameras and say, I hereby blaspheme the Holy Spirit. In other words, they care so little about any possibility of heaven or hell or any of those things that they're willing to make a stand and say, if there's a way that I can remove myself from this equation, even if that means hell, I'll take it. What a ridiculous internet trend, right? And what I want you to understand is this. That was a really weak interpretation of what this verse actually says. Now, I'm willing to admit that this is a really kind of puzzling passage. And there has been a lot of debate over the centuries about what Jesus meant when he said this. But we should be really careful in our consideration so that we can interpret it rightly. Because if they're right, that simply saying that I blaspheme the Holy Spirit automatically, if there's a hell, condemns you to it, then we would have to be really careful never to say that, right? But if they're wrong, we need to know how they're wrong so that we can minister to people who feel this way. So, first of all, I think we need to ask ourselves the question, what does it mean to blaspheme the Holy Spirit? So we should understand this. The word blasphemy literally means malicious talk, defamation, or slander. It is willfully speaking something that is blatantly untrue for the purpose of doing damage and harm. It is presenting a lie as the truth which then damages the actual truth. And if we understand Jesus to be the presence and purpose of God, then blasphemy would be to instead claim that Jesus is not God and that the work that Jesus did was not done through the Holy Spirit and was not the purpose and plan of God. Blasphemy, then, is a blatant mischaracterization of the person and the work of God through Christ by the Holy Spirit. Now, with that in mind, I want to present to you two um, valid perspectives and interpretations of this verse. When we're considering what does it mean for us to blaspheme the Holy Spirit. One fairly solid way to interpret what Jesus is saying here is that it is specific to his present context. These religious leaders, called the scribes here, claimed that Jesus was an agent of Satan, a lord of demons. Now, our understanding of the Trinity comes into play here for us to understand this. We believe in God as Father, as Son, and as Holy Spirit. And during his ministry on earth, the Holy Spirit was working through the Son to do these things. So, as I said, these people slandered the work of the Holy Spirit by personally saying this to Jesus after witnessing these things personally from Jesus. They blasphemed the Holy Spirit as being evil. Now consider once again the words that we opened our service with this morning. In Isaiah chapter 5, verse 20, it said, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness. That is precisely what these religious leaders had done. They had seen the work of God through his Holy Spirit in the person of Jesus Christ, and they had said that it is the work of Satan. With the evidence of God's work through Jesus right in front of them, they called God's work the work of Satan, and that is blasphemy. So, if we take a really narrowly contextualized interpretation, it would seem that what Jesus is talking about is specific to this instance. 
the unforgivable blasphemy of the Holy Spirit could be understood as specifically saying that Jesus, that they had witnessed, was possessed by the devil and working for Satan. It is them saying specifically after what they had seen of him to his face that he is an agent of Satan. We can understand it as specific to this context. Now, for anyone who might worry, what if I've accidentally committed the unforgivable sin of blasphemy? If you take this interpretation of the verse, you're off the hook. You have not committed the unforgivable sin of blasphemy because you did not personally witness the work of Jesus Christ in this moment, at this time, in this way, and say to his face that he is doing the work of the devil. You are not capable of that level of blasphemy. However, there is a second interpretation of what Jesus is saying here that I think that we could understand it a little more broadly. Seeing the example of these religious leaders as indicative of a particular condition. This is the position of famous philosopher and theologian, St. Augustine. Augustine interpreted this passage as reflective of a perpetual state of disbelief. He saw blasphemy of the Holy Spirit as the long-term condition of being perpetually antagonistic and dishonest and hostile towards the work of God. Understand this. It is not a state of ignorance. It is in a temporary position of unbelief. We could understand blasphemy to be the condition of a heart that is hardened to the truth. Again, we can understand that to be true of the scribes uh, that were talking to Jesus in this moment. They had decided in their hardness of heart that this was not true, and they perpetually stood against it. And in that way, we could understand that they would suffer eternally for that, that there would not be forgiveness for them. Jesus understood seeing the depth of their sin in their hearts that they would not repent of this sin. In fact, they would go as far as to falsely accuse Jesus of crime so that he would be publicly executed. And these men about whom Jesus is speaking did suffer hell, are currently suffering hell because of their perpetual condition of a hardness of heart. That's a condition that we, th we could understood, understand existed then and could continue to exist now. There's a theologian named Henry Alford who describes blasphemy against the Holy Spirit in this verse like this. He says this. You'll see it on the screen. It is not a particular species of sin, which is here condemned, but a definite act showing a state of sin. In that state, a willful, determined opposition to the present power of the Holy Spirit. Now, I would wager that nobody in this room falls into this category because of your participation here. Even now, I would say you are probably not a person standing in persistent, willful, determined opposition to the work of the Holy Spirit. However, I think we would be wise to admit that it is absolutely possible for people to be this way. You likely know, or at least know of, people who are willfully determined in their opposition to the truth of God. We should not be so naive to think that nobody blasphemes the Holy Spirit in this way today. They absolutely do. There are people in our world who are hardened in heart, who persistently and consistently blaspheme the Spirit of God. Think of Paul's words from the book of Romans, chapter 1, verses 28 and 29. Paul says this, speaking of people who are opposed to God. He says, And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God... God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. We can understand that there are and always have been people who willfully refuse to acknowledge the truth of God. And as, hard for us, as hard for us as it may be to digest, God has given some people over, as the verse said, he has given them over to a debased mind. 
when we see things culturally in our lifetimes that seem to make little sense, that seem outright evil, that seem even nonsensical or against all reason, I'm reminded of this verse. Why does our world sometimes feel like it has gone absolutely crazy? Because some people are so determined in their blasphemy against God that they have been given over to a sickened and depraved and broken and debased mind. They are so consumed with the array of sins that Paul lists here in this passage that they literally do not think or comprehend rightly anymore. And we rightly can consider that to be the perpetual state of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. And those kinds of people, as difficult as it is for us to comprehend, will suffer the righteous wrath of a holy God. We should understand this. In that passage, Jesus did not call this unforgivable, but rather that some people will have no forgiveness. In fact, Jesus said at the beginning that all kinds of sins and blasphemies will and can be forgiven. So that it isn't that forgiveness isn't possible for blasphemy, but rather that in some cases for some people it simply isn't sought. A harsh reality of the gospel is that not everybody goes to heaven. Not everyone is saved. Some will be willfully determined in their opposition to God. They will slander his name. They will blaspheme. And they will sometimes be given over to a debased mind and will suffer hell as a result. And to be saved for us, we must, as Jesus made clear, repent and believe in the good news of the gospel. We must know and walk in the presence and the purpose of God. No longer living in confusion, but with eyes open to the truth in submission to what we understand to be actual reality. This is where I want to lead us as we consider this difficult passage and finish up for today. What are we to do with this? How are we to respond to this? The last blank on your sheet is this. I think we need to be reminded this morning, in the light of all that we've learned and read, that we should seek to live in the presence and purpose of God. We should seek to live in the presence and purpose of God. Our entire existence hinges upon the person and the work of Jesus. He alone is the savior of this broken world, a world that in many cases even hated him. But this is what we can know for sure, and hear me on this very clearly. Paul also says in the book of Romans, in Romans chapter 10, verse 13, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So this morning, the first application point is this. Do not let your heart be hardened. Do not be given over to a debased mind. Consider the evidence before you. Jesus is the Son of God, and he has called you to live according to his own purposes. So call upon the name of Jesus. Recognize him for who he is. Repent and believe the good news, and then walk according to those purposes. But the second aspect to our application of this passage is also really important. While it is true that some people will blaspheme, some people will be given over to a debased mind, some people will indeed suffer hell, here's the thing that we must understand. We don't know who those people are. But we do know that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord can and will be saved. So then our job is to relentlessly display the presence of God to others, to obediently join in his purpose of leading people to repentance and belief in his only son, Jesus Christ. Think for a moment with me of the most lost person that you know, the most hostile hater of God, the person that you know wants nothing to do with God at all. Now, you could walk away from a lesson like this and think to yourself, well, I mean, I guess they're, they're given over to a debased mind. Maybe they're, they're destined to suffer hell because of this, and you could just throw up your hands and give up. But I don't think that's the appropriate application of what we've seen here. What we know is this. All who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. 
We could do what is right, and instead of giving up, we could keep presenting the truth of Jesus Christ to exactly people like this, because this is what we understand based on the Bible. Every person is a sinner, making you an enemy of God until you're not, because God is in the business of saving even the least likely of people. The people who seem the most against him often are the ones who come to faith and become powerful. Think of Paul himself, the author of these passages from Romans. Paul was, by all accounts, a hater of God. By the definition that we have put forward today, by his actions in turning against the Christian church and persecuting other Christians, we could consider him one of those people who was blaspheming the Holy Spirit until God changed that. God turned around even a blasphemer like Paul and made him into one of the most important missionaries to ever live. That's what God can do for all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. So our application from Jesus' teaching about blasphemy here is not to be discouraged. It is not to give up and throw up our hands and give up anyone and everyone who slanders God. No, instead we should be motivated driven and propelled in his presence and purpose to share the good news of Jesus Christ with all people, even those people who are willfully determined in their hatred of God. You see, there are some people who are incredibly willful and determined against God, but the job of believers like us is to not just match their will, to match their determination, but to surpass it. We should be even more willful, even more determined for what we know to be good and true and right. All who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And after that verse, Paul says this in Romans chapter 10, verses 14 to 15. He says, how will then they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him on whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? Ladies and gentlemen, Seeing what we have seen in the gospel today, you should not be left in a state of confusion. We know who Jesus is, we know what his purpose is, and we can live in that presence and purpose. And if you have, if you have repented of your sins and believed in the good news, then understand this. As Paul just said, we need people who are sent to display this good news to other people. Understand this. You are sent. Let's pray together as we finish for today. God, even with challenging and difficult passages like the one that we've seen this morning, we thank you once again for opening our eyes to the truth, for allowing us to see who you are. God, we thank you for revealing yourself to us, especially through the person and the work and the words of Jesus, even when those words are hard for us to hear. So God, this morning I pray for a renewed zeal in us. Help us not to be deterred by the fact that we live in a world full of people who are willful and determined to blaspheme you. God, instead, let us be passionately people who seek after saving lost souls for the glory of your name because we know that who you are and what you have called us to do is good. God, help us to be good servants, not fearful or deterred by the brokenness of our world, but rather motivated to serve our great, great Lord.